Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having anything to do before the Honorable, the Justice of the Appeals Court, now sitting at Boston, within the of the Commonwealth, draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God said the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the court is open, and you see it. Morning. Welcome to the April 9th, 2024 sitting of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. Let me introduce our panel. Sitting to my right is Justice Robert Brennan. To my left, Justice Robin Toon, and I am Justice Eric Nyman. We will be your panel for all six, sorry, all five cases today. Usual appeals court rules are in effect, which mean each side has 15 minutes to present your argument. There is no rebuttal in the appeals court. We have read the briefs, we have read your arguments, we are familiar with the case law, so I would urge you to cut to the heart of your argument and not dwell on facts. We know the facts of the case, but of course your 15 minutes is yours to use as you see fit. Two more housekeeping matters. At times you will see the judges looking down at their iPads or laptops. I assure you we are not looking at the Bruin scores, we are not looking at opening day statistics, we are merely looking at the case law and the record in real time and checking your representations in real time. Uh, finally, we would like to welcome um, members from the Boston International Newcomers Academy, students and faculty. Some are here, some will be joining us shortly, and also uh, some students from Boston College Law School. So with that in mind, we'll call the first case. Docket 23P226, Arguello versus Draper Properties. I'll hear first from counsel for the Appellant. Good morning, Justice Toon, Justice Nyman, and Justice Brennan. I'm Ryan Toombs, and I represent the appellants, two minor children, Juan and Joshua Vicuña, through their parents, Lucas Vicuña and Araceli Arguello. We're before you today regarding our appeal of the lower court's dismissal of the Vicuña boys' claim for loss of consortium, which If you pull that microphone over just a little sure. bit and speak up. Sure. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Their loss of consortium case, which arise from the injuries sustained to their father, Lucas, due to the appellee Draper Properties' negligence. This short court should overturn the lower court's dismissal of the Vicuña boys' claims for several compelling reasons. The first is that the Massachusetts Disability Tolling Statute, Mass General Laws, Chapter 260, Section 7, safeguards the Vicuña boys' opportunity to bring these, cl these claims, this case, until three years after their 18th birthday. To the extent that conflicts with Rule of Civil Procedure 19, the case law in Massachusetts is clear that the tolling statute controls. So that's Chapter 260, Section, Section 7. Seven. So that's a statute of limitations statute, correct? Correct. Okay, so you're making the argument that any time a statute of limitations conflicts with a Rule of Civil Procedure, by definition the statute trumps and you have more time to file that cause of action? I think that the case law is clear, looking, for example, to the SJC opinion in Hermanson, that where there is a conflict between a statute and a rule, like we have here, the statute controls. I think the argument is even stronger with mm -hmm. respect to the disability tolling statute particularly, because the SJC has looked at instances where that statute uh, runs in conflict with other statutes of limitations. But I want you to go back to my question, though. Sure. So any time a statute of limitations conflicts with a rule of civil procedure, the statute of limitation trumps. Correct. I think when the legislate when the legislator ha the les legislature excuse me has clearly expressed the need to protect a certain interest through 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 legislation, that should control a rule of civil procedure. So let me give you a brief hypothetical. Certainly. Um, plaintiff brings cause of action for business torts that have a three-year statute of limitations. Um, they bring the, the claims timely. There's four years of pretrial litigation and discovery. And on the eve of trial, the 
plaintiffs tell the defendant, by the way, we have a breach of contract claim as well, which has a six-year statute of limitations. Um, just so you know, we're going to bring that later on too. Would they be warranted in bringing that breach of contract, which for the sake of argument emanates from the same core of operative fact, could they bring that breach of contract claim after the trial ended on the initial claims? Under your theory, I think the answer has to be yes. Yes, and... That strikes me as a problematic answer. So the recourse there would be the defendant could move to have that, that complaint, that case, joined with the, the business tort claim. But wouldn't a judge be warranted, for example, in saying, we've been litigating this case for four years now. This is the first notice that you've given of this other cause of action you intend to bring. You can move to amend the complaint to add it if you want, but the judge would have discretion to deny that motion to amend. That happens all the time because it wasn't brought timely within, even though it met the statute of limitations, it wasn't timely within the context or within the framework of the discovery and the litigation that was ongoing. Respectfully, Justice Nyman, I think in this particular context, the, the overwhelming weight of the age of the children sort of differentiates our situation from the, from the context that, they're from the, the uh, set of circumstances that you put forth. However, I do still think that when we are looking at statutes and rules, the case law is clear that to the extent there is a conflict, the statute trumps. Well, can I ask a different hypothetical, sort of just working within a negligence claim and say the claim gets filed soon after the accident and is tried within a year, um, and then within the three-year applicable statute of limitations for a, a spouse's loss of consortium claim, um, she then subsequently files a new suit within the three-year statute of limitations. Um, and you're saying that it, that's allowed as well, that can't be, um, uh, you know, because it's within three years? So, there, I mean, there really there's no teeth to the, the compulsory joinder requirement of Rule 19 if as long as you can within the statute of limitations bring separate claims at separate times. Isn't that a concern? It's certainly a concern, and I think there's two points to address that issue. Number one, the Supreme Judicial Court in Diaz made clear that spousal loss of consortium claims do in fact need to be brought with the underlying negligence claim. So in that context, it would be required. Similarly, um, the defense could move to compel joinder, and then the judge in that case would have to determine if <clears throat> that spouse, assuming that Diaz didn't exist, was in fact an indispensable party. So I think that's the difference in this case. The judge, the judge at the trial court, Judge Miller, had the opportunity to review and consider these factors. And by denying Draper's motion to compel joinder in the underlying case, determined that the boys were not indispensable parties for purposes of Rule 19. Um, and it's that reliance on that decision that makes the, the, the relief that, that they be barred from bringing these claims sort of unfair and it flies in the face of the purpose, the protections afforded under the disability tolling statute. Um, can I ask, um, in a, if you can, in a sentence or two, it seems like both parties agree that we're chartering new territory here. So what would be the rule that you would uh, suggest we adopt um, in this case? So we certainly recognize that defendants, that all parties have a right to understand a reasonable limit of liability. Um, the case law says that a, a, a child's right to loss of parental consortium can be brought so long as the child was conceived before the injury. That has been deemed to be a reasonable period of time. We assert that a reasonable duration of liability here would be in, in keeping with the statute. That is, until that child reaches 18 years of age plus three years after. That that puts all defendants okay. on notice of the, of the period of time in which they, they would be eligible to injured minors. Are you aware of any jurisdiction anywhere in the country that has adopted that rule? No, Your Honor, but I'm also not aware of any jurisdiction in the country that has required that uh, children's loss of parental consortium claims be joined, uh, such as Draper is asking for in this case. Are you aware of any cases in this Commonwealth where this situation has ever arisen? 
No, or an appellate Your level. Honor. Nor do I believe, I, I, I just simply don't know that it's come before the court before. Right. But, but we can all agree without having the numbers, if it's not part of the record, but we can all, I think, take notice of the fact that this is not the first or the tenth or the hundredth or even the thousandth time that there was a negligence action where a child had a loss of consortium claim. Certainly. Okay. And I th that should be part of the calculus in in ruling for the Vicuña boys, where there's, I don't think the concern of opening the floodgates really exists here, because to your point, negligence, happen, negligence cases happen all the time. Many times those injured plaintiffs have children, and we don't have an overflow or some sort of race to the courthouse with all of these potential loss of consortium claims. Nothing about ruling in the Vicuña boys' favor is going to create a new cause of action or to encourage some huge influx of, of additional litigation. One more, I suppose, not terribly related question, but you seem to be arguing, and correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the reason here is that the children were not competent to testify at the time that the original trial took place, right? Correct. So what if you had one child who's six months old and one child who's 16 years old, and then maybe even a couple other children sprinkled in between? Does that mean that a defendant has got to set it up for four different trials every time a child becomes competent and then is able to express uh, their loss of consortium in a competent manner? That's when their um, cause would accrue or when it just doesn't seem to be terribly workable to me. I think it's important to keep in mind that by, a, by ruling in favor of the Vicuña boys, it doesn't preclude injured injured minors from bringing their case before the age of majority. Certainly that happens every day. There's lots of situations in which a child's parent, with the advice of counsel, makes the decision to bring a loss of consortium claim during the, the child's minority. And that will likely continue. Again, we're talking about a small subset of cases where you have young children, where there's a, you know, a viable loss of consortium claim where the parent has been seriously injured. And to distinguish this case specifically, we also already have a finding of negligence and causation on the part of the defendant. So in your situation, assuming we don't require that those children bring those cases at the time of the underlying negligence action, it's possible that a jury determines the defendant in that case isn't negligent or that that negligence didn't cause the injured parents harm, in which case those four kids or five kids or however many, their loss of consortium claim no longer exists. So the issue has been addressed before, before it's you know, even brought before the court. With respect to that argument, um, you're contending that the jury finding on the special verdict slip um, was essential to the judgment. Yes, Your Honor. Do you have a case to cite wherein uh, a Massachusetts appellate court has held that a jury finding on a special verdict slip, not the verdict itself, not the judgment, but a finding on a special verdict slip has been found to be essential to a judgment. No, I do not, Your Honor. However, I would direct the court to the, the Supreme Judicial Court's decision in the Jarosz case, which is a 2002 case, where the SJC sort of laid out what actually constitutes essential to the judgment. And there's nothing in that case that suggests that the judgment has to be entered in favor of the non, you know, the non-moving party. According to the SJC, for it to be essential to the final judgment, it merely need be that the issue was the product of full litigation and careful decision. And Certainly, after a nine-day trial and three days of deliberation in the underlying negligence action, those two criterion have been met. Is it your position, then, that a party theoretically could appeal on a sufficiency basis, for example, a jury's answer to a special verdict question, even if that was not ultimately the verdict? I think that the, the, that a party could certainly appeal the underlying decision. Um, right, but for I am example, not aware here, of the could the defendants have appealed and said, "Well, uh, we want to challenge the jury's answer that we're thirty percent negligent on the special verdict slip." I certainly can 
imagine situations where something about the sufficiency of the evidence or, or other circumstances that would, in fact, call to, into question the, the accuracy or the reliability or the, the determination by the jury as to those allocations of negligence and causation? That would, that would lead to a lot more appeals, right? I mean, if, if, under your theory, if, if Draper is going to be on the hook for being found 30% negligent or even 1% negligent for subsequent loss of consortium claims, if there is a right to appeal, they're going to want to do it because, and so we're going to have a lot of unnecessary appeals of, of where the judgment went in a party's favor, but nevertheless, they're going to appeal the special verdict because of potential future liability. Again, I think that the set of circumstances where this case would come before the court again are fairly limited. We are talking about not all loss of consortium claims. We're talking only about loss of consortium claims that involve minor children. Um, and it's only in situations where negligence and causation have been found. So I certainly recognize that it gives an additional motivator to, defend, to defendants to consider appeal. But in this case, for example, uh, Draper chose to appeal four separate issues, and that wasn't one of them. Um, so I th I, I, it doesn't appear to me that it would, again, cause this, f this floodgate of, of appeals uh, requests in front of this court. Uh, Your Honors, my time with you is running short. So very quickly, I want to talk about the denial of Draper's motion to compel Joinder in the underlying case, because that became a final, non-appealable order, and frankly, that should govern the outcome of this appeal. Draper, after being notified of our intent to pursue a claim on behalf of the Vicuña boys, filed a motion. The motion was briefed, it was argued, it was denied, and it wasn't appealed making it a final order. The Vicuña your boys... Your time is up, but uh, let me just see if there are any further questions from the okay. judge. Uh, I'll give you 10 seconds to sum up. Your Honors, the tolling statute, the denial of this motion at the underlying uh, negligence action, the, the, the purpose and intent of issue preclusion and, and judicial economy all support a finding in favor of the Vicuña boys and a over, uh, of an overturning of the lower court's dismissal. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. <coughs> Counsel for the Apolli. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is uh, Matthew Green on behalf of Draper Properties. Um, <coughs> I, I, I'd like to take your suggestion and move past the factual background because obviously we're here and there are not a lot of underlying facts. Uh, and clearly uh, you've each identified through your questions the issues here. Um, if, first of all, the idea of this panel uh, issuing an order that any uh, rule of civil procedure is trumped by a statute of limitations is obviously untenable. Uh, the, the logical end result is that based on a uh, minor statute of limitations, such an action could never be dismissed. I, I, under the Mass Rules of Civil Procedure, 12b-6 would be trumped by the statute of limitations. 12b-1, there would be no jurisdictional defenses. Uh, 12b-7, which is in fact failure to join a party under Rule 19, would be trumped by the statute of limitations. That's obviously not how the legislature intended the statute for the uh, extended tolling period for a minor to work, and in fact cannot work because then any minor child could bring a case uh, that would be impervious to defenses under the mass rules of civil procedure. Um, so I, I think that that argument uh, fails directly on its face. Um, I, I also think that the proposed rule that would be necessary for the appellant to prevail would essentially mean that Rule 19 does not apply to minors, period. Can I ask you, as far as the minors are concerned, um, do you agree that with the proposition that in a loss of consortium case, the person who allegedly lost the consortium, uh, their testimony might be important to a fact finder? Potentially. Okay. Well, in what case would it not? When you say potentially, if it's a, a wife or a f parent or a, or I should say a spouse or a parent or a child, whomever it may be. Well, I, I suppose I'm, uh, 
creating a dichotomy in your question between necessary and sufficient. Uh, it, it could be sufficient, and it could carry the day. It could have uh, purchase with a jury, and it could very bit well be compelling, but it's not necessary. In other words, a consortium claim can be lodged by the parent describing how they interact with a child or describing uh, how the child's behavior has changed over time since the injury. So it's not necessary for the right. claim. And so, say a child is six months old. I mean, the loss of consortium for a six-month-old would be different than a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old, right? Uh, potentially, yes. Potentially. And so how do we address that concern, which, um, again, uh, opposing counsel seems to think is an important one, and, and maybe we do as well. That balance is struck by attorneys representing plaintiffs throughout the Commonwealth on an ongoing basis every day in negligence actions and has for quite some time. Uh, it's a strategic decision by uh, whoever's representing the parents and the child as to when to bring that suit. And the competing interests are we have a statute of limitations set for the injured party and we have a statute of limitations tolling period which is extended by statute for, by the child. In valuing how each of those are going to potentially be presented by a jury, a determination is made that in fact it's brought at the same time at a specific strategic time to maximize the value of each separate claim. That's how it's done every single day throughout the Commonwealth, as long as these claims have existed. So putting aside that Judge Miller was put into a somewhat difficult position, Great. would the better decision there, the better choice have been to allow for compulsory joinder, allow your motion, see what discovery, if any, was needed, and briefly delay the trial? As far as the last clause of your question, delay the trial, that's simply not for me to say. That's, that goes to the administration of her court and the timing of the court, and she has other litigants to, to balance against the interests that are directly before her at a final trial conference. I, I can't comment on that. On that. She, didn't, she certainly didn't violate any rules in making that determination. But you filed the motion. I did. So there's no claim here that there would have been prejudice to either party by a slight delay in trial. That's just not part of the record before us. Correct. So would the better practice not have been to allow the motion, join the case, and say, look, this fits under Rule 19A. Let's <coughs> see what discovery you need. Let's join them and let's try the case. It's hard for me to say qualitatively better. What I can say is either would have been permissible. Uh, better is difficult for me to comment on, but certainly either would have been permissible. And based on the transcript uh, of how she evaluated that, I, and that's part of the record appendix, I believe it, uh, it starts at page 78, um, she clearly had qualms about this. She clearly wrestled with this and was wrestling with the two considerations of, look, why didn't you bring this from the outset? Uh, what, you, you've put me in this difficult position and wrestling from the bench of how to deal with this. I now have a case that I have a block which can be tried. I have a man with substantial injuries. The father, there's no, there was never any question that this man was substantially injured and he deserved his day in court and he got his day in court. Uh, to delay that further, I think, would have been potentially unfair to the plaintiff. So it's a very difficult position, a, diff a very difficult balance to strike. And the question before the panel today is, was anything done wrong? And to that, I have, I'd say unequivocally no. It's a, it's a difficult decision that was made that was permissible under the rules. And importantly, what the, uh, pla the underlying plaintiff's attorneys were put on notice, and in fact said on the record, we are taking, we are, we are making a strategic decision. Implicit in a strategic decision is a risk. In other words, we are deciding to do this, and we are taking a risk that it might not work. And in fact, they've taken a risk with no existing case law to allow that position to occur. They're taking a risk that is not supported by any statute, uh, case law, or any other rule within the Commonwealth by no precedent. And it's a strategic risk that ultimately failed. You're saying the risk, you're saying the strategic decision was not to agree to joinder, for example? Correct. Okay. It was put before them. And in fact, I believe that's at – pardon me, Your Honor. That's clear from the transcript. We, you don't, no, we, we don't need 82, to say. Yeah. Uh, record appendix 82, we made a strategic decision. In other words, they decided it for uh, the trial judge. If they had said, uh, well, well, we're open to either or we're open to a slight delay, then it would put it back on the trial judge. But where they said we made a strategic decision, I think – Judge Miller rightly made a decision that said, okay, you've made your strategic decision, now you live with the consequences. You've decided this for me, denied. And that's exactly how she denied it, with a single word, 
And the that risk I, being the law might not be what you think it is. That's absolutely right. And in fact, I think if you look at the way that she pushed questions back on the arguing counsel, that's exactly what she was saying. You really think this? Do you have case law to support this? Do you think this is going to work out the, thing, the way you think it will? You've made your strategic decision. Now you live with it. And that also goes to why this is such a novel issue before the court. We, we, there's a reason there's no precedent for this. It's a strategic decision that isn't supported by any prior case law. Well, that, that begs this question. Diaz at footnote 30 says, yes. <coughs> excuse me, we would leave open the possibility, <coughs> excuse me, that in appealing circumstances the consortium claim might be held to be lost if not asserted by the time the negligence action is tried. Why does your case present such quote unquote appealing circumstances? Well, sure. And I'll make one other uh, brief point on Diaz is in note uh, 29. Well, why don't you answer my question first and then get to footnote 29. Absolutely. Uh, why are these such circumstances? Uh, I think because unequivocally uh, trial counsel in the underlying case said we've made a strategic, strategic decision. In other words, I can imagine a set of circumstances which are a bit fuzzier, which are a bit less clear, which potentially deprived, deprived uh, unrepresented children um, of an opportunity to have their day in court. That's not what's ha what happened here. They were, these children were represented, had sent a uh, notice of claim to counsel that they, they had uh, intended to bring a, a claim in the future, depending on the outcome of this trial. Uh, the fact that they were represented by the, the same attorneys as their parents, it, it doesn't change these facts. It, it, if the children now are unhappy with the outcome of this case, their quarrel is not with Draper Properties. Their quarrel is not with Judge Miller. Their quarrel is not with the appeals court in the underlying case or the appeals court here. Their quarrel is with their parents. Their quarrel is with their attorneys at the time who made a strategic decision on their behalf which had repercussions which they may not like. But that's who they have their quarrel with. Well, I mean, the emphasis on strategic decision, if it's allowed to do this, then attorneys are allowed to make strategic decisions in their client's favor. So it really gets back, I mean, it seems to be begging the question, is this allowed or not? And I guess one question I have is, say this issue was never raised before Judge Miller. Just you went ahead, had the trial, and then a year later, uh, uh, the, the children file suit in that case. The issue was never kind of teed up for the initial judge. Sure. Is it the same analysis in that case because the, the boy should have known to bring the claim at the same time um, when the, the father's claim was being tried? It's the same analysis under Rule 19, because substantial risk, I believe, is put before the judge who's decided the motion, should they have been joined previously. Um, the facts going into that analysis, I think, are a little less clear if they weren't represented at the time, or there was no mention of them during the underlying trial, or for some reason they didn't live with their parents or weren't known. I, I, mean, I can imagine facts which would make that factual determination a whole lot more thorny, but that's not what's here. This is crystal clear that they had representation, were aware of their harm, uh, were even contemplating their lawsuit at this time, and simply refused, simply made the strategic decision not to uh, bring their action uh, at the same time as the first. So just to take that, you're not arguing that in all circumstances a loss of consortium claim necessarily has to be brought with the uh, uh, the, the, the underlying plaintiff's claim. But not at all. It's a circumstantial analysis that courts have to make as to whether that should have happened or not. Yes. And, and in fact, I think this can be decided on a very narrow ruling uh, based on the facts and the compelling circumstances uh, in the underlying case and also that were before Judge Wilson when he decided the 12B6. This need not be a broad sweeping rule. Uh, and in fact, different jurisdictions have handled this uh, different ways. Uh, in fact, I, I, I would like to uh, correct uh, my sister who said that there were no foreign jurisdictions. Uh, who held that loss of consortium claims by a minor had to be brought at the same time as the parent. In fact, Alaska, uh, Connecticut, and New Jersey all do. Um, those are broader rules. But in fact, Illinois has a rule that uh, you can bring it, but it's actually at the discretion of the defendant. If the defendant insists that it be brought at the same time, then it has to be. I, I, I think that it can be cut down more and more and more, but the point here is that the, the two questions we have are, if you overturn this result and send it back, it opens up a Pandora's box of multiple trials and appeals, which are not only unnecessary and need not be done, but will clog up the courts. Uh, I think in affirming the result here, you can absolutely do this in a very narrowly tailored way to say, this may not, <clears throat> 
rule out all loss of consortium claims by minors in every circumstance. Uh, but nevertheless, given the compelling facts presented here, uh, it, it meets with, uh, I believe it's footnote 30 of uh, Diaz. Are you? Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, you go ahead. Does it make a difference that in, in Felch, the uh, uh, Supreme Judicial Court said that loss of consortium claims aren't derivative in Massachusetts? Because I think in other states, they do treat them as derivative. And I wonder, does that make a difference to our analysis here? No. The independence or derivative of the claim, that's not something we rest on. That's not something we're arguing. Uh, no, frankly, it doesn't. Uh, in fact, I think what Felch shows is that there are, in fact, limitations on statutes of limitations. It's, it's dicta, I, I agree. But nevertheless shows that uh, the court is permitted to uh, create rules that, that put some reasonable limitations on statutes of, lim statutes of limitations. And not only that, but contrary to what my sister argues, a statute of limitations is not sacrosanct. It's balanced against other judicial uh, precepts, ju other judicial concepts uh, that may very well result in a claim being dismissed on other grounds, even though the statute of limitations has not yet run. I want to make sure I understand your argument clearly. Are you arguing that Judge Wilson had discretion to allow or deny uh, this motion at the end of the day, or are you arguing that he was obligated to do so? It's an interesting question, I'll, I'll admit. I mean, Rule 19 contains the word shall twice. So I, I would argue that there is not within the rule itself discretion. However, within those two shalls, there's a, a term substantial. So there is some discretion to determine what does substantial risk mean. That's not a defined term within the rule. And that's uh, 19A2, I believe. Um, so yes, a, a, a judge confronting these circumstances, if they make a finding that there is a substantial risk for uh, double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations, then they shall uh, uh, compel joinder, or if the, com uh, if the required joinder was not made, shall dismiss the secondary action. If there are no other questions, uh, I'm happy to rest on my brief. No, thank you. This case is very well briefed, well argued, and the case is submitted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. Calling our second case, docket 23P574, Doyle v. Bulger. Good morning, Your Honors. Nice to see you, Counsel. Good morning. David Hadass. May it please the Court. Um, the lower court erred when it declined to dismiss negligence claims against the City of Quincy police chief and one of his officers. Um, the, those, uh, those negligence based claims should have been dismissed under the Mass Torts. Claims Act, Chapter 258, Section 2, which provides immunity to pub public employees, such as these officers, not merely from liability, but from suit, um, which is why we're here today, because it's an important issue um, that the courts have made clear should be uh, resolved even at the appellate level early in the case, uh, so as to um, provide the immunity that the statute um, entitles these officers. Um, the court essentially ruled that the, uh, whether these officers were acting within the scope of their employment um, was an open question, a question for the jury, and that flies directly in the face of Chapter 258, Section 2, and the immunity that it entitles these officers to. Can I, just my, I guess first and most focused question is, the complaint that was filed alleges that all of Bulger's activities, I'm paraphrasing, were under the color of law. Correct. How do you get around that? If it's all under color of law, then how is it private? That's exactly, that's exactly our point. They have conceded that this was an officer acting under the color of law as a city of Quincy police officer 
Um, the only the only distinction between this officer and any other officer who's entitled to immunity is that he was working a paid detail rather than being on regular duty. So if we take that out of it, though, do you agree that it's a question of fact? Agree that we what? take out that assertion, that allegation of the complaint that it was all under color of law if that was taken out or if there's something conflicting in the complaint that makes that less clear, then does it become a question of fact as to whether the officer was, Officer Bulger was acting as a police officer or a bouncer? If, um, if there were allegations in the complaint that this officer was acting in some way other than what we expect, uh, how, how we expect officers to act, um, then it might be a closer question. But there are no allegations. The only allegation that the plaintiff makes um, that distinguishes this officer from any other officer is, again, the, the fact that he was on a paid detail. And right. Our, that, and, that's and, a, right. That's right. just And our, our contention is that you don't lose your immunity just because you go from regular duty to detail duty. Does Del Rosso say something different? That, that's, that's Davis? Yeah. Sorry, yes. Davis. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. uh, Davis, um, it, well, with Davis, and it's, it, it's a 50-year-old case, and it says that this officer was essentially acting as a bouncer. And the facts of the case make clear that this, this, of, this officer was acting as a bouncer. Uh, two, uh, two people having an argument at, at the bar. The bartender says, hey, Stevie points at them, the officer um, punches one of them in the face, knocks their teeth out, and the court said, that's essentially, you're a bouncer. You're not a, you're not a police officer. Um, and, and so I would point this court to a more recent case, a Superior Court case, uh, the Wynn case, where um, I believe it's the first time that this, this specific issue was addressed since Davis. Um, and Judge Locke uh, determined in the Wynn case um, that a uh, police officer working on a detail that, that's uh, is not a great respect for Judge Locke, but that's not precedent for us. So, no, certainly not precedent, but I think it's instructive um, and a a, a, uh, a a case worth looking at. So that begs two questions <laughs> for me. Um, the first one is: Would you agree? Uh, first, Davis and Klickner are the controlling authority here on this issue. Would you agree with that? Sir, you want to distinguish Davis, and, and I, I appreciate sure. that, but would you agree they are the controlling authorities as the law currently stands in Massachusetts? Yes, yes. Okay, so my follow-up to that is this. How can we say as a matter of law that Bulger, or as a matter of fact, that he was working within the scope of his employment? Wouldn't we need to adduce facts through discovery how was he hired? Who's paying for it? If there's a contract, what does it say? Um, there's a million open questions on that issue. And my guess is your reply is going to be, I agree, but that needs to be pled in the complaint. But let's assume that that's, inferences can be drawn, and we draw the inference that he's on a paid detail. It could be either or. We just don't know at this stage of the litigation. Help me out. That, uh, the it seems to me to be the crux of this case, by the way, at least yeah, as to Yeah, Bulger. no, I, I agree, Your Honor, and the complaint is a detailed complaint, and uh, it makes a lot of allegations and goes into great detail as to the events of the night in question and does not uh, state at any point in time uh, that Officer Bulger acted in any other way other than as a police officer. Um, so we have what to... What is work, it? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, well, go, it says he ahead. was working on a, on a detail. Right. Other and, than and that, the fact and, that and he's on a detail. The notion of a police detail is pretty ambiguous, right? You can have, there's a lot of room for different approaches, as I understand it. Someone can be, you know, working on the roadside protecting a work crew, or maybe, as in Davis, you know, working as a bouncer. And we really can't tell here from the complaint exactly were the, what were the circumstances in, to, to satisfy the Klickner control test, right? I mean, that's just sort of an, un, an open question. I guess the question is, do you think the plaintiffs failed to plead what they need to make that an issue 
that would require some kind of factual resolution. And maybe because I agree with you, immunity is a threshold issue that needs to be decided early, doesn't need to go to the jury necessarily. Um, is that something that we send back and say, let's have an expedited uh, inquiry, discovery and inquiry into this particular issue? Or do you think it's clearly resolved from the face of the complaint? I, I would rely on the face of the complaint. It's the plaintiff's obligation. If they want to um, overcome immunity, uh, which, which is a, a, supposed to be a, a powerful defense um, to which these officers are entitled. If they want to overcome that, they need to say in their complaint what those factors are that would allow, just like in Klinkner, uh, that would allow the court to override the police officer's immunity. They but need to say it. Go, go ahead, finish your finish yeah, that, I'm just saying, they need to say <laughs> it, and they, didn't, and they didn't say it. In fact, they said the opposite. As a general rule, doesn't the burden of proof fall on a party that's claiming that someone is acting within the scope of their employment to prove that? I know there's different contexts in which we look at that inquiry, but in general, that's something you have to prove. And so I wonder if, I mean, if, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a very strong case as to Chief Keenan. Um, you can't just say the fact that he's being sued in his personal capacity is enough to get you over the hump. But maybe saying this, he was working as a detail um, at a private club, which is not something that police officers normally do, maybe that's enough to sort of say this, there's enough issue to get to the next phase and we need some factual development. I, again, I, I think the burden was on the plaintiff to articulate exactly why this immunity is not available to this officer and, and they didn't do it. Um, otherwise, otherwise, a vague complaint would eviscerate the immunity um, to which these officers were entitled. They, they could, they could, a plaintiff could be purposefully vague uh, in the complaint and say, judge, give it to the jury. Let the jury figure, th figure this out. Um, immunity doesn't work that way. Immunity is supposed to uh, protect these officers right at the beginning. How would the, how would the plaintiff uh, know how the officer is being paid? I mean, we may all know that generally they pay the department, the department funnels it down, but that's not anywhere in the record. And theoretically, the plaintiff would have no clue as to that, right? That, that, that may be the case, but... Um, and if, in fact, the officer was being paid by the club itself, privately, here's an envelope with 500 bucks, great job tonight. Does that make a difference? Well, um, no, I think, I think the focus really needs to be on the officer's conduct um, during the night in question. Just like in Klickner, um, the court looked at the fact that the officer was uh, not on duty, it, it was... Um, commuting to the police station, but he wasn't there yet, and, he, and it wasn't, uh, his shift hadn't started yet, and he had been drinking all day at a, uh, at a, at a, at a golf uh, tournament, purely personal endeavors. And so the court looked at all those circumstances, pointing to the fact that at the time of the accident, this officer was, was not within the scope of his employment as a police officer. Can you Here, remind me, was that at the motion to dismiss stage in Klickner as well? That was after a trial. Um, so the, so the, uh, the court had the benefit of, right. of all those facts. Um, and, we, and we don't know whether, they, whether the, uh, the officer filed a motion to dismiss, so it may, it may not have even well, occurred. To the extent this case turns on status, okay, the status of Officer Bulger, let's start with Officer Bulger. The only thing we have before us you're telling us is that he was doing a paid detail. Correct. Not having a definition, we sort of have to go by plain language. What does a paid detail mean? The officer acts just like any other police officer would, except that the, um, the private club, in, in this instance, is, is paying for it. Um, that's, that's, that's the only difference, and the complaint... It means it's paid work conducted by a police officer, but do we know, does paid detail indicate whether or not they're acting what, what their motivation is, what they, to whom they're reporting, who pays for it, what their obligations are. It seems that all of those are questions that could only be discerned through discovery. That's, that's true. I mean, we are at the motion to dismiss stage, so all we have is the plaintiff's complaint. And so, yes, we, don't, we do not know a lot of these factors um, that might be might be relevant. We would argue not really relevant. It's more the, it's more the officer's 
uh, conduct, how wh what what he's doing there, what what his purpose is. Um, well, one of the factors under Klickner is whether it is motivated, at least in part, by a purpose to serve the employer, right? Correct. Correct. Um, so I, I would just rest on the fact that the plaintiff did not articulate anything that would lead us to, uh, to believe that this officer was doing anything other than acting as an officer. And just in general, I mean, as far as a policy Can I ask, what about all the allegations that relate to the uh, patrons at the VFW being relatives of Quincy police officers and uh, that whole line of, uh, that whole area that, yes. so that the motivation wasn't strictly in his capacity as a police officer, at least what he should be doing as a police officer. Yeah, yes. Um, well, uh, yes, there, there are those allegations. Um, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't put the officer's um, role uh, uh, as an officer that night. Um, into, into any different light. Um, there, there are a number. So if he were working just on his, doing his regular shift and uh, stopped a guy who was clearly intoxicated driving a car and says, oh, geez, that's the chief's kid. Have a nice night. Okay? And then something, you know, they turn the corner, you know, hit a car full of people. Immunity would apply in that situation? That's, that's right. Um, so, so it's, I mean, and, and there are a number of allegations made about, about both the police chief and the and the officer here. I'm not, we're not we're not saying that uh, you know we're not arguing like summary judgment. Um, there are there are a lot of allegations like that, but uh, but they're still entitled to immunity uh, because of the role that that they played in in these events. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you very much. Appreciate the argument. We will now hear from counsel for the Apolli. And nice to see you as well, counsel. Good morning. If you could hold off one second, we're going to have some um, guests join us. And again, before we begin this case, I'd just like to reiterate, we're welcoming members of the Boston International Newcomers Academy, uh, students and faculty, welcome to the appeals court. And we're hearing our second case right now, and Attorney Curran, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Justices. It's a pleasure to be before all of you. Um, I'm gonna get right to the chase. The key issue in this case is the scope of employment regarding Officer Bolger and Chief Keenan. Like in any case, the plaintiff is somewhat handcuffed in regards to the information he can obtain prior to discovery. So when you see a complaint that's drafted, there are three things that you see in our complaint. One is that he's working a paid detail. Two, he's being sued personally and individually. And that conduct takes him out of the Mass Tort Claims Act and qualified immunity. So when you look at the factors that go in, the standard at a motion to dismiss, as this court is aware, is a minimal hurdle. The defendants get another bite at the apple at summary judgment stage. And as a result, you ha have to take all facts as pled as being true allegations. But we, we can't rely on conclusory allegations under the Inichino standard. We need plausible basis to, to say it's possible that either of these defendants were acting in their personal capacity, right? It can't just be the fact that you sue them in their personal capacity. There has to be something else in the complaint that would support that finding. I, agree? I, and I, I, I agree. I agree. But what we do have is in the scope of employment, which is important, is let's separate Bolger from Chief Keenan because that makes it a little clearer for the court. Bolger is there on a paid detail. Are there any officers with him? Does he report to any superior officer in the command? 
Does he have to sign in with the owner of the private establishment, the commander of the Nickerson Post? Who does he report to? Who controls his conduct? Who allows him to leave early? Now, the facts that we have is that Officer Bolger knew the Potters, knew them to be family of members of the Quincy Police Department. He knew that this was a politically connected establishment. And he knew that the Potters were intoxicated, potentially under other narcotic substances. So, so can I ask this, why does that not just make him a bad police officer? Or a police officer who's performing his duties poorly and even perhaps unethically or improperly or dishonestly in that particular occasion? In, in the police officer's discretion, if he chooses not to investigate or not to do something to protect the safety, but when it becomes a political decision that you make or a personal decision because it may be beneficial to you. I feel like you're conflating two things here, right? That the question that we need to decide is the capacity um, at which Officer Bolger was working at the VFW post. The, the circumstances they may well have affected his conduct when you're under, under allegation when he was there don't seem really pertinent to the initial question, which is, who was he working for, right, under the Klickner test? And I think that's, in, in, right. and when we look at the complaint, all these questions, who paid him, who directed him, there really isn't a lot to go on other than the fact that you allege he was working in a paid detail at the VFW post. And so I, I don't know if you know those facts or those facts are yet to be developed, but do you think that's enough when you just allege he's working as a paid detail at a private establishment? Is that enough to get you to the next phase so that we can explore this issue in fact, in fact development? I do. I do think it's enough to get to the next stage. As Klickner and the other cases have said, this analysis is extremely fact intensive. And the quotes that they've, the cases have said, unsuitable for resolution at the motion to dismiss stage. Just because someone may have the moniker of under the color of law, doesn't mean he doesn't deviate from that at, at any time. And that evening, if, if he was under the control of the commander or the post employees, it takes him out of qualified immunity because he is there as a bouncer in the same capacity, removing people it, it, or, or bartender. And, and in those capacity and evaluation, we have a right to, to conduct discovery to further flesh out those facts to support the allegations of the complaint. So the same argument would apply then, I take it from your perspective, to the police officer who's working a private detail for a, a company directing traffic. Like you see sometimes you're driving down the street and, and there's a police officer who got the crews with the flashing lights in full uniform and he's letting all the people who work at the company out while I'm sitting in my car waiting to get home, I, right? And let's say he doesn't pay attention, car cruises out and smashes into my car. Personally liable in that situation? Need more facts. Okay, so you're just saying not dismiss. If he's on a public street, or is he on private property? Is he on a public street, and is he the one that's in control of the traffic in regards to stopping people or not? There's, so there's factors that have to be flushed out in that, in that situation as well. And here, we're in private property. He's acting as a bouncer. And during the escalation of violence, he leaves his post early. That's for personal interest. That's not for the advancement of any official duty if you find him as a police officer. But again, I guess, how is this different than a police officer who responds to, I guess he's not working for them, but we don't know, who responds to private property, who's doing crowd control, and then says, look, I've had enough of this, and just leaves, and then the next thing you know, someone gets beaten to death. How is it any different in terms of the officers, the capacity in which that person's working. Okay. What, what is the officer's role on a highway detail or a detail on a local street? That's for traffic control for the safety of the workers. 
So here, but theoretically, you're there for the safety of the patrons. Absolutely, for the safety of the patrons. And so, when there is an issue and the violence starts to escalate, okay, and if you make a political decision that may be of personal interest to you, that's outside the scope of your employment. If you're saying the Potters are members of the Quincy Police Department, I'm going to do them a favor and I'm going to cast a blind eye and I'm going to walk away. That's a political decision. I, I don't, th I don't think the, the political versus personal motivation really gets into the Klickner test, which is whether at the outset the, the employee's conduct fell within the scope of the employment, right? We have to make that decision as to what Officer Bolger was doing. Who was he working for when he was at the VFW post? And what say, subsequent issues about what he was motivated by seem less relevant to me to that. And I guess one of the concerns about your complaint as to Officer Bolger is, uh, Justice Brand has already brought up, you, you allege everyone acted under color of state law. Now that's not, in, that's an inquiry for 1983, not really for the MTCA, but it doesn't help your case. And you also allege that, um, in paragraph 34, you talk about police detail officers acting in violation of Quincy's rules and regulations, which suggests that Quincy exercised control over people who, act, uh, who acted in police details, which so, again undercuts your argument that uh, but, under the but, Klickner but test, it, he, was, he was acting for the VFW post, but, not but for the, Quincy. the laws, Quincy regulations, and the Quincy, city of Quincy requires at any functions that there's a concert that, they, that the local establishment has to hire a detail. The detail reports to those establishments. The establishments, I say, and the inference are drawn here on a paid detail, are in control of his obligations. Where is he going to go? What does he want? What is he going to be doing that evening? If there is an issue, to instruct him to either remove someone or not to remove someone. Those are all factors. Because on the facts of this, on a paid detail, the inference is that he's acting as a, like a bouncer, like a doorman, security detail, not as a police officer, not as a police officer that's following the command of a superior officer or anyone else in his department. He's following the commander of the post, James Doherty. So you agree that Klickner and Davis, you agree with your brother that those are the controlling authorities here? I do. Okay. So how under Davis, and you've been asked this in different ways, but this is to me the, the root of the issue here. How under Davis does pleading that there was a paid detail, which to me is contains an ambiguity, there was a paid detail, how does that rise to the level of showing, or at least alleging, he was not acting within the scope of his employment? Well, one, to start, the paid detail paid by the private employer, the post. So it's not that, like he's... That's an, that's an inference we can draw. Inference you saying. can draw that he's not being told, like when he reports for duty to go patrol a particular area, he's being... He's signing up to do a private detail at an establishment in Quincy. And he goes and he answers to the private employer. And he's being paid by the private employer. That if, if it's enough, and I hear you, if it's enough to allege Officer Smith was doing a paid detail, and that in and of itself takes him out of the scope of his employment, and therefore out of the scope of immunity, who would ever volunteer to do a paid detail? I mean, how would, how would an officer ever, in his or her right mind, ever volunteer to do that if they lose immunity as a matter of law? Because money changes people's decisions. If they're going to be able to make money, they may weigh the risk. That's a risk that they have to weigh. And I am sure that their unions at every level on the details advise them in, in, of their risk. But the I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendously significant difference here, right? It, under one scenario, Officer Bulger is immune from liability for negligence. And you're just arguing negligence against him. There's no intentional torts, you've 
against Officer Bolger, right? On the other hand, if he is personally liable, then not only is he not immune, he's not subject to the $100,000 cap under the MT MTCA. He's, he is personally liable for whatever damages may be found to have resulted from his conduct, right? So it's a tremendously d important decision here, and I well, guess... Well, like, Keenan, like Bolger, when you're dealing with affirmative acts, we take the position that because of their affirmative acts, they've taken themselves away from immunity. And the affirmative acts is, is the decisions. And there's just not one negligent error. There is a litany of affirmative decisions that are the original cause of this accident. Because of the political connections of the post, I decide, and it's because we run into trouble when it's the failure to investigate, the failure, failure to inspect. And, you know, but the issue here is no. I'm outside the scope of my employment because I have said to them, this is a politically connected establishment. Create a consequence-free zone. Do whatever you want up there. So are you arguing then that as a general rule, a detail assignment is within the scope of the police employment and therefore they have immunity, but then if their actions speak otherwise, that, that's a different circumstance? No, no I'm not. Okay. I'm not. That's what, what I thought I, I heard I'm you saying. I didn't think that's what you were saying. argument in regards to Keenan, because we haven't addressed Keenan, and Bolger. When they had make a plethora of decisions based on a political reasons and to do favors for politically connected people and to protect them in their little corner of Squanum, Massachusetts, say, no one go up there, no one enforce rules and regulations, let them do what they want. That's where you're saying the chief gets brought that's, into this. That's when now they are outside the scope of their employment. It's now, and it's multiple decisions over many years, and which culminated is if things are getting out of control and there's a lot of drinking and fights out there, it, the common sense says it's going to escalate. And it did. And it was foreseeable that it was going to cause the death of Christopher McCallum. Can I just ask quick? I mean, I, I don't see anything in the complaint that possibly justifies treat, treating Chief Keenan as a, acting, having acted outside the scope of his employment. He wasn't working at the VFW post. He wasn't paid by anyone other than the city. You may, be, you may view that his conduct was improper or, or negligent, but I don't see any basis in the complaint to sort of conclude he acted outside the scope of his employment. What can you point to that would establish that? Well, I, the complaint does allege that he refused to investigate complaints up at the, at the post, refused to send cruisers around to check on it, especially nights that there's functions. Yeah, but in, in his role as, as the chief. Right, but when you make that, you make that decision based on a political favor, that's when it gets changed. Now you're outside the scope of your employment because now you're making a, your, your role is to protect and serve. Not to only protect and serve a few, it's the whole community, including Christopher McCallum. Just, just so I'm clear though, seems like a theme this morning, but if we go with your political favor, Theory, we're carving out some new area of the law here. You agree with that? There's, not, there's no case that says that so far. I, I'm not aware of any cases that say that so far, but it's, it, is, it is common sense. Okay. Anything further? Anything further? Uh, your time is up. Thank you both for the excellent briefing, excellent arguments, and we're going to take this case under advisement. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Justice. Case has been submitted. Calling our next case, I believe it's the Polo or Pollo versus Peters, 23P676. And before you begin, counsel, my understanding is that this case be partially impounded or at least involves a minor so please refrain from using proper names we can use father mother and child okay absolutely and we'll start with counsel for the appellant good morning may it please the court I am Keely Clancy I am here on behalf of the mother appellant the um, 
The issue we're here today on is whether there was sufficient evidence to support the legal conclusion that it was in this minor child's best interest, a three-year-old, for her surname to be changed from that of her mother's, which was given to her at birth, to that of both of her parents separated by a hyphen. And now I want to take a moment to somewhat clarify um, what, what what I'm talking about when I say whether there was sufficient evidence to support the legal conclusion. The legal conclusion would be that it's in the child's best interest. That's our legal conclusion. Now, I think that it is quite possible for there to be findings that are made in a case that aren't necessarily clearly erroneous, but also don't support the ultimate legal conclusion. You're, you're getting at my initial question, which is you said that the standard of review here is to the extent that the judge made findings of fact, we accept them unless they're clearly erroneous. We agree with that. Correct. You then went on to say that uh, the remainder of this judge's decision we reviewed de novo. Do we typically review um, a judgment? So there was a trial here. There was, yes. So do we typically review a judge's determination after a trial on a de novo basis, that struck me as a little bit odd, and I could use some we, guidance. We, we do, typically. Um, that, is the, that is the standard. I do believe it was also the standard that's cited by Father, and I think really um, what we can look to for most recently, because this petition to, to change the name of a minor child is probably not um, an issue that comes before this court very often. Gomes case. Is, exactly. We can look, we can look to um, Gomes v, uh, v. Candido, which once again did reaffirm that when um, we are looking at the um, legal conclusion in the case, we are looking at it with a de novo review. And Gomes was post-trial as well? So Gomes was somewhat unique in that it was, there was not what I would call a full trial. There was the, uh, the judge exercised his or her discretion um, to, after the pretrial, to um, make a decision right then and there. Right, so that's why I'm wondering if, the, if our situation, because there was a trial, our standard of review is different here and must be somewhat more, at least somewhat more deferential. I, I, I don't, I ask because I don't know. Well, I think that, um, and, I, and I mean, I think that's a, that's a fair statement. I do think also that the, besides just um, Gomes v. Candido, I think in, um, all of the Massachusetts case that are cited in both briefs, I believe, regarding a name change petition, do talk about de novo review of the, um, of the final legal conclusion. And so the issue, the issue really in this case is a judge can, can hear the evidence, um, as, as she did at this trial, and can make findings, but there has to be a causal link between what they found in those findings, and then their ultimate legal conclusion. So let me, on that point, you seem to take issue with those findings, or at least the sufficiency of the findings, right? And say that it's insufficient, uh, there was insufficient evidence or record evidence to support the judge's conclusion that it's in the best interest of the child to have the name change. Yes? Yes. Assume for the moment that the sole basis that this judge found was that having both parties' names will recognize her dual heritage. And that's an important and essential part of the identity of this child, I mean, extrapolating, and therefore that and that alone would make it in the best interest of this child to have a hyphenated name, because otherwise if it's a middle name, eh, he kind of gets lost along the way and who really knows what people's second or third middle names might be. That's actually exactly what I'm arguing, is exactly what you just said, and I think that's exactly right, is when I say that I think that there wasn't sufficient evidence, I really do think exactly what you said. I think the only real thing that the trial court hangs its hat on in its actual legal conclusion is a conclusory statement that it, it is in the child's best interest for her to bear both of her parents' last names to separate to celebrate her dual heritage. Right. There's no, there are absolutely no findings of How fact. do you say it differently, that having both parties' last names will recognize her dual heritage? I mean, how would you say that differently to say well, it's in the best interest of a child to have both of her parents' names as part of her last name so that her dual heritage may be recognized? That's in her child's best interest. Well, but why I don't... Why should we not just accept that finding, or how can we find 
that that is, is well, I'll let, sorry, let me. Yeah, sorry. absolutely. I mean, it's a great question, right? But why? So I think there's a difference between whether a child ha having a ch child having both last names celebrates their dual heritage and whether or not that is necessary to serve a child's best interest, right? So we're underneath the child's best interest standard and we also know that the petitioner has the burden of proof. They are, it's not the objector's um, job to prove that the uh, name change should not happen, that there would be harm or anything like that. It's a affirmative burden. So. We saw that a lot in Gomes v. Candido. We basically saw the court saying something similar to what I'm saying here is the, um, the mother in that case wasn't necessarily saying that the judge didn't make findings relevant to the Jones factors, because he did. She was just saying those factors, even, even with those factor, factors, it doesn't support the legal conclusion that it's in the child's best interest. So there has to be some sort of causal link between why is it required for a child to have both parents' last names in order to celebrate their dual heritage. Why, why, why is that necessary, right? Because Doesn't the father's testimony fill some of, that, some of those holes? The father testified at trial, yes, dual heritage is critical. She would feel otherwise, she would feel left out. It's an opportunity and a means for her to be closer to her siblings and identify with them. It's an opportunity for her to be closer to her family. Uh, the father did provide, or at least testify to, a litany of reasons which I think it's implied that the judge accepted those because the judge found the father to be credible. So why is that not enough? Well, I think the father's testimony alone is self-serving, right? So naturally, he It's up to that judge to credit it or not. We, that's something that we as a court cannot do. We, the so. judge also makes a finding completely contrary to that in that she makes a finding in her decree wherein she says... The court finds credible that mother does not deny child's Cuban heritage. To the contrary, she embraces the child's diverse background. So what I'm saying here is, is there is no evidence that this is necessary to celebrate the child's dual heritage. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary that regardless of whether a child has two surnames or one surname, that her Cuban heritage is being celebrated in both households, there's absolutely no evidence besides speculation on father's part saying, well, I think maybe it could make her feel this way in the future. Maybe it could this. The, the so findings also- what would be also, an example of something that would tip the scales? What additional evidence would be needed? Um, I would say something along the lines of the, there's, so there are some cases where, you know, it is obviously found that it is in the child's best interest. Um, Sometimes if there is a estrangement between a child and a father and you need that to preserve the relationship between the parent and child, and that really kind of focuses the inquiry again, is, is that it has to affirmatively be in the child's best interest. It's not enough to just say, well, this, would, this wouldn't hurt her. This wouldn't hurt her, so we should That's do not it. what the judge said, right? The judge said affirmatively, and I'm reading it, that uh, it will allow the child, she has an interest, best interest in having both of the names to encourage her to, it will recognize her dual heritage. And why is that not really for the fact finder? I mean, wh why are we going to find as a matter of law, essentially, that that's... Well, I mean, wrong? especially if you're just, if we're just saying, okay, she just said it, she just said it in the rationale, and that's good enough, right? I mean, clearly, well, then based that's on what be Justice good enough Nine said was testimony from the father. I mean, but that's going to be good enough in every case then, right? I mean potentially every child comes from, has dual heritage, right? Every single child is, has potentially from unmarried parents has the potential to have two surnames. Right, but this is what judges do, right? And, and they, they have to, or juries, when there's a trial, they make findings of fact, credibility determinations, and they make decisions that unfortunately leave 50% of your audience walks away unhappy. But that's the essence of the jury process. It I seems to me that you're advocating for a statutory change and well, you want to say, hey, legislature, look at what results are, could be coming from your wording of this statute. You should probably make this more restrictive. I don't see how that's a judicial determination. I mean, though. I think it's kind of maybe the inverse of that. It's kind of the, the you know, future consequences argument that this case then does that, right? Because it then opens up the door where it's not what the legislature intended. Um, 
Father, in his brief, uh, talks about a Delaware statute where they actually, the legislature took that step. They said, we're going to create a presumption that if a child has, even from unmarried parents, has two parents and the request is just to add a surname by hyphen, we are going to create this, this presumption and it has to be rebutted. We don't have the legislature here in Massachusetts doing that. They're not creating a rebuttable presumption. We're underneath the best interests of the child standard. And so I think it's just stretching it a little bit too far and making it too wide and applicable to too many cases. If we're just going to say that a, that a child having both surnames recognizes their dual heritage, that, that potentially applies to every single case of, of a child from unwed parents. I think there needs to be more um, in order to meet the best interest of the child standard. I also think the problem is, is you can't have a, and, 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 this, and the judge in this case, um, her rationale is just labeled rationale. It's not further finding a fact. So that is just her rationale. I think when she's saying, she makes, the, you, can, you can't really make a finding that it's in the child's best interest and then base your rationale on the finding that it's in the child's best interest because I think that's circular. Conclusory. Yeah, yeah, she makes, I mean, she makes that finding, number 29, this court finds that it's in the child's best interest to bear the last names of both her, her parents. That's the, that's the ultimate legal conclusion. But the findings need to, the findings need to tell me why specifically. It doesn't need to, I don't want the findings to tell me why it's not gonna hurt her that was the issue in Gomes, right? We have this burden flipping, which I, I would argue we see a little bit here. Um, number 30 of the judge's uh, findings, both parents have a strong and loving relationship with their daughter, which will not change when the child bears both last names. That's showing no harm. Again, we're not showing why this is affirmatively serving her best interest. Number 33, the court finds that when she's able to write her full name, it will not be onerous to add a hyphen between the names. Again, we're talking about why we're basically saying, what's the big deal? Why not? And that's dangerous. That's dangerous because we need to show that it is necessary to serve the child's best interest. There was no evidence at trial that there is any issue with this child, her identity. In fact, both parties testified that she comes from loving families. She has wonderful relationships with all of her extended families. There's there is nothing here that we need to fix. There's no interest we need to serve here. And so that is the concern here is, is that the findings here, they don't support the ultimate conclusion. And we also see the judge saying um, in her rationale, the name will simply require hyphenating the child. So we're getting into this, well, it's really not that big of a deal, kind of. And I think that that is kind of a little bit of a dangerous. The standard is a standard. So no matter what, whether you're asking to hyphenate, to change, it doesn't matter. The standard is whatever change you are asking for, it needs to be the child's best interest. I think that you can, I don't think it's explicit, I think you can glean from the record here that the judge kind of felt as though, well, it's not that big of a change. So it's not that big of a deal, but I think that goes both ways, right? It's not that big of a deal, then why are we gonna change a child's whole name? You know, essentially, and so, and we are, we're changing a child's name. Just because we're hyphenating doesn't mean we're adding a whole last name that this child, this child never had. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring this court's attention to is, is I, did, I did notice that um, in uh, Father's brief, he does make this one, and it was the, honestly, this caught my attention because uh, it was the first time that I've seen this, um, where he says that he believes that a judge may consider a child's ethnicity. Do you have As, a page reference on that point? Yeah, this is page 16. Thank you. Um, and uh, that the judge may consider a child's ethnic ethnicity as one factor in the overall consideration. The site there is um, McDonner v. Doobie. So McDonner v. Doobie was a complaint for modification case where the mother was asking for a myriad of things. One of the things was removal of the children and the other was a change of name. And so um, the court talks about the child's ethnicity as it relates to the removal request in there, but then does later on mention it as it relates to the name change, however, quotes adoption of veto as its source for that. Um, adoption of veto. Adoption of veto doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. 
Adoption of veto Your does time's not. Time's expired, but you may sum up. If there are um, no more questions from the panel, I rest on my brief. Thank Seeing you. Seeing none, thank you very much. Attorney Bowers. Good morning, Justices. And <clears throat> my name is Anthony Bowers, and I represent Ricardo, um, the father here. I beg your pardon, and the appellee and the petitioner. Uh, he is present in the gallery with me today as well. Um, I appreciate the focus on the child's ethnicity, but to me that's not a singular issue here. You know, I think it's interesting to note that Judge, Judge Ordonez met with the parties a little more than a month before trial and actually discussed the Gomes case and discussed it at length with them at, I think they called it a settlement conference. And I think the judge was noting that there's lessons to be learned from the Gomes case. Because the Gomes case uh, took the trial court to issue for, as Attorney uh, Clancy had suggested, for focusing on the harm that would be caused if well, that, we did, that if begs we the most it. crucial question in this case. Tell us succinctly how you would distinguish Gomes. I would distinguish Gomes is because the judge took the Jones factors, made rulings and findings relative to each and every single one, and. Um, the Jones factors are, are pretty simple, and that was really the lesson from Gomes is the court didn't adhere to that and, and, and apply the So you're the saying Gomes here factors. the judge considered the Jones factors, and in Gomes the judge did not? That is correct. So I would suggest, <clears throat> and I, I add the ethnicity as a permissible factor for a couple reasons, not just because this court in McDonough held that it was a permissible factor, albeit perhaps misquoting adoption of veto, which was a multiracial adoption, but I would also suggest that <clears throat> ethnicity can be considered in the first Jones criteria, which is the preservation and advancement of the relationships with siblings and parents. And in this case... What do you we, say to the argument, I believe that was made, that it actually, this child will be the only child with that last name? Well, but... The how, does that, how does that... Uh, the hyphen hyphen shares the name with the two brothers from the mother's side and a brother from the father's side. And then the child would also... None of them have a hyphenated full name. No, that but they, name. They, she Polio would identify Peters. with each family because she would be the uniqueness and the bridge that both parents testified she, that she was, the bridge between two loving and caring families. And she was also the... Well, we're extrapolating a lot on that. I don't disagree necessarily, but I don't think we can say that. It could either make her feel like the bridge or make her feel like the I don't know, lone ship out in the... See, I think the, the father testified that to that, and he said sometimes that, 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 that she does not feel like she's as connected to the father's family as the mother's. And I think that's part of the judge's rationale here, uh, to make her feel connected to both families, to both ethnicities. And I think that's incredibly intertwined with those relationships, because feeling closer to the father's extended Cuban family with, I think, five siblings and dozens and cousins is really important to that connection with the father and the immediate brother. So uh, I think the judge was well within her discretion to find that ruling on the Jones factor regarding the familial relationships. So uh, the just, second, just, just to get back to my initial question, so you're distinguishing Gomes because the judge applied the Jones factors here and didn't apply them properly there. Are there any other distinctions you're making? Um, well, there were twins in that, and I would also suggest I don't believe there was a, there was a a sibling on the father's side in that case to consider either. However, the, the real takeaway from that was that, that they didn't, they applied the, the, the improper standard. Do you have, um, speaking of standards, to Justice Nyman's original question, what's our standard of review, of review here? I would suggest a no vote because the attack was simply upon the legal conclusions, not the facts. I know they take issue with some of the facts, and I, I tried to point that out in my brief. That's a different standard. It's a higher standard. Then why That's have a trial? I mean, I, I, have, I have difficulty with that. It's de novo, so a judge has held a trial. She makes findings of fact, and then she marshals those facts together, and you're telling us start all over and do it anew? That doesn't make sense to me. It would seem to me there would have to be some, it would be more of a sufficiency case than a de novo review, at least, but maybe that's what de novo well, means in this context. I guess I'll back up and suggest that their sole issue is the sufficiency of the evidence for her legal conclusions. Uh, I guess that could be a higher standard, but the legal conclusions themselves, I think the SJC has said they're de novo review, and I would default to that. In any of those cases, did any of those cases involve a determination or an appeal after trial? I 
don't believe so. I think that what uh, uh, Nickerson, I think, went to trial. I'd have to double check on that for you, Your Honor. I'm, I don't know off the top of my head. <clears throat> so getting back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Jones factors, uh, the judge also made rulings um, and, and determinations of fact with regards to the length of time that this child has used the name and her, her identification with it. And I think she said it was quite minimal at that time. I think both parties may have testified that she, while she knew all four names, she could only write one. Uh, and I think the father testified that, or the mother testified she didn't even, probably didn't know what a hyphen was, and that the father testified that it probably wouldn't be a problem for her to learn to write and add a hyphen. And then the court found in its facts it wouldn't be onerous for her to, to add a hyphen to those names. So I think that was, that was also a Jones factor. It was also addressed in both her facts and her rulings. Um, well, let me address an issue raised by uh, the appellant. They state that the dad initially filed a 209C motion seeking the name change, correct? That is correct. And the basis for that motion was the dad effectively said, look, I can't get my daughter's medical records because of this name issue. And the judge ultimately denied the request for name change, correct? That is correct. So then the dad files this motion and has asserts new reasons. And the judge holds a trial and comes up with a verdict. And then before a motion to stay is allowed, the dad immediately goes to all of, or at least to several health care providers and says, here's the name change, which may have motivated the judge then to allow the motion to stay. Uh, should the judge have been troubled um, by the conflicting evidence about the dad's motivation? I don't think so. His, his, his his position was pretty clear, and I spelled that out in my brief. There was a 209C action, and Judge Ordonez presided over both, which I point out in my brief. She also made a finding that that wasn't relevant to the current name change petition. And she, as I mentioned, she was there for both and, and ruled on that 209C motion. Um, the, as far as post-judgment, the father was pro se post-judgment and felt that the the application of the judgment was, was, was enforceable at that time and rightfully or wrongly went to start changing her name. However, when she got the orders and I subsequently appeared on the case and I, I actually put that in my addended uh, record appendix, there were corrective actions immediately. So he did correct that based on the, but I would suggest that may have just been a, um, a misinterpretation by a pro se client at the time or a pro se a litigant at the time post trial because uh, they can be confusing uh, some of the post trial uh, rules and um, application of the judgments. But lastly, I just want to discuss the last um, Jones criteria, which is whether the child will suffer any difficulties or embarrassment with, with regards to the proposed name change or keeping the existing name. And the judge makes specific findings to that as well, Your Honors. Um, she says there will be none. And she also suggests that medical providers and schools won't have any problem accommodating those, those, those changes, which I think was one of the mother's contentions. Um, she says there will be no embarrassment, and the child is aware of all four names, and she currently identifies with just the first and can write it. Um, so that being said, the, I think the, the Jones case actually points this out. Now, they were referring to reversing a name change, but they said the change sought could well subject her to embarrassment and confusion at school and require at least some awkward explanation to her peers. And I would suggest if her name stays the same, that could happen here. The father is a school teacher. The child will go to the same district that the father teaches in. All three of her brothers have gone to the same school district. So if she has to explain to her peers and her educators while she's related to some children and shares her name and not another brother and shares her name, or she's related to a teacher and doesn't share his same name, that, that's an awkward conversation. And I think the judge was well within her right to make findings and rulings with regards to that. And it's also a Jones factor. So, and then I, I added the ethnicity because of the McDonough court. And I think the Cormier v. Quist also brings up an interesting point, the allocation of custody is certainly a factor in this determination. And the judge clearly ruled on this. In fact, the party submitted a uncontested statement of facts that have been getting a trial uh, saying that th they share legal and physical custody. Remember in the, the Cormier case, the Cormier v. Quist, the mother had sole legal and physical. And the, the court here said, 
well, that has to be a factor, and you didn't, you didn't ration, put that in your rationale, go back and do it again. So all four of those factors were addressed here. And I throw in ethnicity, but I do that for two reasons. One, I, like I said, the first factor, which is a familial relationship, and the pres preservation, which I think the appellant's argument focuses on the pres or less on the pre more on the preservation, like nothing's wrong here. Well, the law also says the advancement. And I think the, the advancement of these familiar relations is key. And I think that's where the judge rested her hat in affirming this name change and allowing it of the father's petition. Any, any questions? Seeing no further questions, thank you both very much. Interesting case, well briefed. The case is submitted. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate your time. The panel's going to take a five minute recess. Court, all right. Thank you. 
Fourth, all rise. Court is open. Please Calling our fourth case on the list, docket twenty three P seven zero one RH versus Newton. To the extent there are Pounded materials, uh, please refrain from referencing them. And uh, as you see, although uh, the Apoli did not file an appearance or a brief, we are going to allow a limited argument here today uh, as a courtesy. The panel, in its discretion, has made that determination. So, with that said, we will hear first from counsel for the Apollant. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is John Cassidy. I represent uh, the defendant, Appellant uh, Alice Newton, M.D. Uh, Alice Newton, uh, Dr. Alice Newton was the... Who's with you today at council table? Uh, I'm sorry, this is... Um, Good morning, Your Honors. Darlene Dawson on behalf of Shrine and Hospital. Thank you. Go sorry, ahead. Your Honor. Separate party. I didn't... Uh, Dr. Newton was the uh, director of the child protection team at the Massachusetts General Hospital at the time and, and still is, and in that capacity uh, provided uh, child protection consultation services to the Shriners Hospital as well. Um, so that's how uh, Dr. Newton became involved uh, with this. It's our position, uh, Your Honors, that uh, the trial court erred in uh, denying our motion to dismiss the defamation claims against Dr. Newton uh, under the anti-slap st uh, statute, and uh, specifically in the context of Dr. Newton being a uh, mandated reporter under uh, Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 119, Section 51A. Um, so. In, uh, in the lower court's decision, uh, the defamation claims are uh, discussed, at, I, I believe, beginning at page 19 in the court's order. Um, the court, um, a little bit inexplicably to me, 
really doesn't discuss anything about the defamation claims other than to put forth what might be a prima facie case for a defamation claim in a vacuum, if you will. And by that, I mean... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure that we set the stage appropriately in this case. So the judge allowed the motion to dismiss under 12b-6 as to all claims except for, I believe, two counts of defamation. Correct. Five counts of loss of consortium and one count of vicarious liability. Is that correct? Th that's all correct, Your Honor. And my follow-up question is, my understanding is that the five counts of loss of consortium in the count of vicarious liability under the judge's findings all are rooted in the defamation count. So if the defamation ca claim stays in this case, then the other claims stay in. If the defamation claim is out or should have been out, then all of the claims go away. Is that the argument you're making? Th that's, exactly, that's exactly correct, Your Honor. Was there a cross appeal filed in this case? Not, not to my knowledge, Your Honor. Okay. So then I have a follow-up question, which I think needs to be answered here, um, because we understand your argument, and it's to what extent does the recent SJC case on slap motions, and that's the Bristol Asphalt case, to what extent does that impact our analysis in this case on the special motion to dismiss argument? Um, I have to confess, Your Honor, I don't know. Okay, because the SJC issued a case within the last two months, it's Bristol Asphalt, which uh, changed the entire um, special motion to dismiss analytical framework. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got to get our arms around, number one, that change, and number two, whether or not that change applies to this case, and number three, if so, how does it impact your argument? Okay. Um, I, I'm going to be perfectly candid with the court, Your Honor. I, I wasn't familiar with the Bristol Asphalt case, and I apologize. Um, so it's okay. Um, so I, I'm not in a position to, to address that. What I, what I will say, Your Honor, is that uh, I think under even under a uh, 51A and 12B6 analysis, uh, the defamation counts, like all of the other counts in the uh, complaint uh, should have been dismissed uh, as well, I essentially for the same reasons, Your Honor, and by that I mean I don't believe there's any question uh, that uh, the alleged defamatory statements or conduct uh, took place in the context of Dr. Newton fulfilling her legal obligation as a uh, mandated reporter um, in this case, um, unlike some anti-slap cases, this is not a situation where uh, the, the reporter or the petitioner uh, has an option, if you will. Dr. Newton is a mandated reporter uh, with respect to suspected child abuse. And if mandated she reporter statute requires one to act in good faith, correct? That is absolutely correct, And Your while Honor. I'm no way, in no way suggesting that there is no good faith here, isn't that a question of fact based on the pleadings and the state of the case? Your Honor, I think good faith could be a question of fact, but I think it has to be, uh, in this context where we're looking at a motion to dismiss, there has to be something in the pleadings beyond uh, conclusory allegations, Your Honor, to support a claim of bad faith. And here what we have, Your Honor... Aren't they quite specific, though? I mean... I beg your pardon? I, aren't I, I just the, aren't the allegations quite specific? Having read through it, there are myriad, myriad allegations which would tend to suggest bad faith. They're just allegations at this stage, but there's a plethora of allegations that things that were said by the uh, Apoli were either um, ignored or intentionally misrepresented uh, by your client. Um, I, I could go on and, and go through them, but it seems to me that bad faith is alleged with specific examples thereof. But, but, Your Honor, I think if that's the analysis, then I think any, uh, any claim under 51A can be uh, circumvented, if you will, by simply making a, a claim of bad faith 
And as a policy matter, I agree with you. So can you direct me to some law that supports your argument? Well, Your Honor, I think under uh, under Reichenbach, Your Honor, I, well, first of all, Your Honor, I believe that the court's uh, review, and again, I apologize if this changed under Bristol, As Bristol Asphalt, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but I'm, I'm not familiar. Um, but the court's review, the standard of review, I believe, is, is de novo in, in this situation. And um, the, in, in the Reichenbach case, uh, the court talks about the fact that uh, in the first, the, the first step of the Duracraft analysis, um, uh, the, the standard of review is de novo. And I think that um, <clears throat> your honors can look at the uh, complaint and look at the conduct. I, I think it's important in this case that the two vehicles, if you will, of alleged defamatory statements in the case were number one, uh, what Dr. Newton set forth in the medical record, and number two, Dr. Newton's testimony um, uh, before the New Hampshire courts in the criminal cases that were uh, brought against the Hannah Morris. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reasonable basis to contend that those two avenues of conduct were not being done uh, in the context of her status as a mandated reporter. So what, 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 oh, no, no, what, what did the judge do wrong with respect to the anti-slap special? Uh, sh sure, what Your exactly Honor. did the judge, where, what, what's the error that you're claiming? Sure, Your Honor, thank you. I, I, I think what the judge did wrong was he, he didn't, and if you look at his, his order, he didn't really analyze the uh, defamation claim in the context of uh, chapter 119, section uh, uh, 51A, chapter, uh, chapter 119, section 51A, the mandatory reporting statute. But did the judge say that anything that Dr. Newton did that was involving statements wasn't covered as protected petitioning activity? Did the judge find that? Or, or, or was his analysis something different with respect to the anti slap petition? No, that, that's, I think, what I'm trying to say, Your Honor, is at least to my reading of the court's order, the court's decision, it, it, he simply didn't address it. It's silent. It, right. What, 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 he's, I'll just, what he said, and this is page 14 of his decision, defendants, you, contend that plaintiff's con claims are premised entirely on petitioning activity by a defendant. Um, but then he says down below uh, uh, um, that there are uh, allegations directed um, not solely at petitioning, but regarding poor medical treatment and misdiagnosis of AW, right? So that's what he said. There's other non-petitioning non conduct in the complaint. And so therefore, I'm going to deny the anti-SLAPP statute. That's why I understand the basis of his anti-SLAPP ruling to be. Do you agree with that? I, I agree with what Your Honor read, but I, I don't agree, Your Honor, in terms of the analysis because... Why is the analysis wrong? I, I'm sorry? Why is the analysis wrong? Because, Your Honor, if you look at uh, subsection G of 51A, it, it specifically... Uh, I'll read it if, if I may. But that's, that's, that, that, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's, the, that's a different provision here. I'm trying to understand the anti-SLAPP provision, anti provision deals with petitioning conduct, right? Right. And... And the judge said, no, look, in this complaint, there's non-petitioning conduct alleged, malpractice, things like that. So is that a basis, is that a proper basis to deny your anti-SLAPP petition with respect to the defamation claims? Your Honor, it would be if it were correct. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not correct because if you look at 51AG, it specifically indicates that that is part of the petitioning conduct. It, it says... No person shall be liable in any civil or criminal action for filing a report under this section, contacting local law enforcement authorities or the child advocate, or providing information or assistance, including diagnosis. This is the whole point, Your Honor, this, this claim that, that, you know, misdiagnosis is alleged and that somehow takes it out of petitioning activity, that, that's simply wrong in my in my view based upon upon the statute because uh, once again if that were the case every time you have a 51a claim all someone has to do is say 
the doctor made a misdiagnosis. The whole point with 51A is they're mandated reporters. They have a legal obligation to report. If they suspect, they don't have to be correct. Can I? Can, I'm oh, sorry. Just can, can misdiagnosis serve as the basis for a defamation claim? I don't believe so. Right. Honor. So don't we have to, when we look at the defamation claims, which as Justice Nyman points out is all that's left here, don't we have to look at the conduct alleged in the complaint that pertain to a possible defamation claim and assess whether that conduct for is protected by protected petitioning conduct or not? Don't we have to sort of limit our analysis and we don't go outside and consider other allegations that don't pertain to a potential defamation claim? I, I, I hear what Your Honor is saying, but I don't think in this setting, in this case, in this context, that's really possible because the alleged defamatory language statements are part and parcel of the 51A reporting requirement. So, which theoretically is petitioning activity. Which is petitioning activity. Right. I, I so let me let me just so I understand it. My I mean, again, my thought process here is that you've got two parallel but interrelated tracks, one under 23159H and one under 51A sub G, right? That you got you got the anti-slap solely petitioning activity, and you also have a, theoretically, a protection under 51A as you've discussed. Is I, that fair? I, I think that's correct, Your Honor. On the 51A subsection G, your argument is that if you don't essentially presume good faith in these circumstances, it makes the protection toothless, right? It, it, correct, Your Honor. I mean, I, I, What I, about the other side of that? What about, what do we do with a person if it's a doctor, and I'm by no means suggesting that Dr. Newton or anyone here did that, but in a theoretical sense, if a doctor or a social worker simply makes things up out of malice or out of hostility or because they're uh, racist or whatever the reason may be, how if they have uh, immunity under 51A, subsection G, complete because it's part of their mandated reporting behavior, and presumably in good faith, uh, and because under 23159H, well, it's part of the 51A report, so it's petitioning activity. How do we address th that situation, if not by one of these two? I just want to make sure I understand. You're, you're saying if there's bad faith, how do we address Assuming that? Assuming that there is horrendously bad faith, yes. Well, Your Honor, I think... And, and your response is, well, they, they just said it. I mean, so... You, Anybody could say it's really, really horrendously bad faith. What do we do with that situation? What's the, what's the um, avenue or what's the recourse for a plaintiff in that situation? Well, again, Your Honor, I think there has to be more than, than conclusory allegations. I mean, I, I think the court, uh, the lower court could have, this court can, de novo, examine what the, what the allegations are, look at the the reporting that was required and that was done uh, because I, I think, you know, again, where we go with this ultimately is, uh, your okay. Time, any, your time is up, but you can finish your answer. Uh, you know, anytime you allege bad faith, that brings you outside the statute and, and you escape, if you will. And I, I don't think that's the, the intention of the statute. But um, uh, so just to summarize, if I may, uh, I, any further questions? I do, actually. So uh, Judge Toon has some more I'm questions I'm sorry. I, okay. So I, I, I do think you really need to take a look at these uh, uh, SJC decisions. There's Bristol Asphalt. There's a companion case called Columbia Plaza Associates. Um, just assume for the moment that we actually agree that the judge misapplied the, um, the anti-slap statute and, and with respect by considering conduct alleging the complaint that could not possibly support a defamation claim. Um, the second part of the test um, under the anti-slap statute is for the burden to shift to the plaintiff, the party uh, opposing the special motion, to show that Dr. Newton's petitioning activity was devoid of any reasonable factual support or any arguable legal basis and caused her actual injury. So assume we get to that phase. Is that something that we should decide now based on the pleadings, or should we remand to the Superior Court for that determination? I, I think if you get to that second piece, uh, Your Honor, I, I think it probably should be remanded. 
And to be clear, we don't know what we're doing with this case. We have not made up our minds. So. No, I, I appreciate that, and I, I, I'm just trying to be candid. I mean, I think if you get to that place, then I think remand is probably, probably what should happen. No, thank you. No, thank you very much for your excellent argument, and we will now hear from the Opoly. Morning, Your Honor. Uh, you have to go to the podium. It's okay. And just, again, under normal circumstances, uh, you're required to file a brief in order to argue, but uh, the panel has exercised its discretion to hear you briefly. We would just urge you to um, raise issues of law. We know the facts well. We've read the briefs. We have the entire record before us, and we also read your response today, um, and we'll read it and research it further in the, in the coming days. With that in mind, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, uh, appreciate you letting me speak and the opportunity to be heard. Um, I guess I'd just like to point out, to clarify, that Dr. Newton didn't write the 51A, in my understanding. Tufts did, and I'm not, Tufts is not anywhere on this document. I'm not filing this lawsuit in an attempt to prevent people from exercising their duty as mandatory reporters or to cooperate with law enforcement. I think Judge Krupps was correct in. Um, I understand I wrote this complaint as a non-lawyer, basically, just starting law school, don't know anything, wouldn't write the same complaint today, just did my best. But, um, and it's very hard to represent yourself. This is just very distressing. Uh, but um, I think Dr. Uh, the, the judge in the lower court was correct in finding that there were things, there was a period where she was hospitalized and Dr. Newton was acting as a doctor and she was talking to people that were her colleagues and she was making medical legal conclusions. And I believe that they were incorrect and defamatory. And I believe that she, she there's a difference between filing a 51A and cooperating with law enforcement or with DCF and having a private conversation in your home with your husband with no, you know, with confidentiality. And that's not what was happening here. Um, and I also want to point out that there's many mandate, mandated reporters in the state of Massachusetts. And if we just, I read defendant's argument, I mean, sorry, defendant appellant's argument as being everybody that's a mandated, mandated reporter in Massachusetts is protected from defamation in virtually all circumstances. They have basically qualified immunity. And that would cover a lot of people other than just doctors and child protection. Um, and I don't know if you want to make a carve out for, you know, I would argue against doing that because this just has such a devastating effect on families. Um, and it's been six years. It's been a long time. I'm still dealing with the effects of it and the, everybody is, um, my, my children. So I guess I'd just like to say that I, I'm not, this is not about stopping 51As, that the 51A is not even a part of this case. I mean, it's what I've never seen Dr. Newton's 51A, if there is one, is what I'm trying to say. And if, I think if they're asking for a motion to dismiss, they're saying I don't even have a prima facie, prima facie case. I don't know what Dr. Newton said to who and when and whether it was protected or not at first impression. I just know for sure that she talked to people in the hospital. And I, I believe that the lower court was correct in saying that her treatment in the hospital was a problem was problematic the, the I have a question for you and that's the statements made by Dr. Newton that you are alleging or that you alleged are defamatory are statements she either uh, conveyed to other hospital and medical personnel one two statements written in you know medical notes or medical reports and three statements made um, either to police or in testimony at, uh, in the New Hampshire matter. Is that, am I correct? Um, my, yes, I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm not my husband's criminal lawyer. I didn't have a trial, but my understanding is she was actually not allowed to testify as an expert witness because her statements were so prejudicial and she was only allowed to testify to like what she saw. But I could be, I, I'm, I'm just asking about oh. the statements that you allege that were defamatory the universe of those statements consists of statements that she conveyed to other hospital and medical personnel, that's one. Two statements she wrote in either medical reports or notes. And three statements she made in the course of testifying as a witness 
um, or being or statements she made in the context of uh, lit, of other litigation that she was either called to participate in or did participate in. Are there any other statements I'm missing? Um, defamatory statements. I think she. Honestly, I don't know all the defamatory statements she's made at this point. It's too early. In terms but of what's in what your I, complaint. What's alleged. Yeah, those are generally the three buckets. As far as the third one, I don't want to stop. My intention in filing is not to stop people from testifying, but like a lot of her testimony relied on things that she said at the time. I understand, and, but am I correct as to not the content, but the universe mm -hmm. of her statements is as I stated to you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, that's helpful. I don't have any further questions for you. Don't no, don't. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, I just thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you both for your time. We appreciate um, the briefing and the case is submitted. Thank you. Calling our next case, our final case on the list, docket 23P949. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. If not, please correct me. I'm going to guess Wojcik versus Lovett. There first from uh, attorney, is it Desenzo? Yes. May it please the court, Andrew Desenzo on behalf Desenzo. of the appellants. David and Jean Wojcik. Wojcik. Correct. Um, the land court committed reversible error below first when it found that the present day Lovett parcel owned by the appellees, James and Leanne Lovett, benefits from an easement by implication across the current day parcel owned by the Wojciks. And second, when it found that the Lovett's unilateral and unauthorized clearing of a then dirt road um, by excavating and pouring unauthorized fill, gravel, and other materials to widen into a construction access road did not constitute a trespass. Uh, the Wojcik seek reversal of the land court and in order that a declaration issue that the Lovitz have no easement rights across the access road on the disputed right of way and an order issue that the Lovitz pay the unrebutted um, costs to remove the unauthorized fill and other materials. Um, I'll begin with the finding of an implied easement and I will focus my presentation on the finding of an implied easement as opposed to the discussion of a title right of access to the property. Although the, the title issues do inform the analysis here, um, the judgment rests upon a finding of an implied easement and that's based on the fact that the dominant and subservient estates were owned in common between, I believe, 1937 and 1966. Um, and, and that is um, a finding that uh, the land court judge made below and has not been appealed, that um, any title right that existed prior to 1966 was extinguished by that common ownership. Um, there are three guide rails for the court to consider um, as, it, as it decides the issue of an implied easement. The first is that the Lovitz as the party who are seeking to establish an easement, even though they are the defendants, bore the burden of proof at trial. Second, because the evidence at trial was primarily documentary, um, deeds, plans, and so forth, and inferences drawn from those documents, this court's review as it pertains to the finding of an easement is largely de novo and those inferences are entitled to no weight on appeal. And third, the relevant time for the inquiry as to whether a implied easement exists is 1966 when common ownership was severed. It was not 2018 when the case was filed or 2022 when the case went to trial. It's 1966. Um, the December 1966 deed from the prior owner or a prior owner, Ida Dexter, to her son Henry, severed this common ownership and did not reserve the right of way, which I referred to in my brief as the green right of way and is referred to as the disputed right of way in some of the trial court papers. Um, was and, not, and that's not disputed, right, that it was severed? I, I, I 
there was some commentary about that in Pelley's brief. However, they did not file a cross appeal, and that was a finding that the land court judge did make below. Um, so, so I don't think it's before you want to appeal. My understanding is that there's an agreement that it was severed. The question is whether or not it was resuscitated. And I know that's not the correct nomenclature, but... <laughs> so I, I, I think it's a, a, a bit different. It, in the land court did not find that the, um, any easement was resuscitated. Rather, just use the existence that the land court judge found of an easement as background to support a finding that there was an intention to reserve an implied easement. It's not the same easement. It's a different easement that purportedly arose by implication. So, so Ida Dexter gives, essentially gives this part of the Wojcik's property, or what's now the Wojcik property, to her son for $100, less than $100. And, and the judge is like, well, she's living where the Lovett property is now. She's not just going to landlock herself, right? She's going to keep access to the main road by... So that, that's the kind of the primary basis for the implied easement. Do you disagree that there was a need for her to maintain that road so she got get at, out of her property? We do, yes. Um, and, and that's based upon there, there are at least... There are two other primary means of access that could have been used at that point. And, and I, I think in response to your question, the premise of your question... Um, to my knowledge, and there's no evidence otherwise, Ida Dexter was not living at this property at the time. These are properties that abut Lake Lashaway in East Brookfield. She had a summer cottage there, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. So she's, a summer so she's camp, going there, right? A summer camp, summer cottage, and there's no evidence in the record as to how often Ida Dexter right. used the property at she that time. She used it probably at some point. That's likely we can infer that. I, I think that's a fair inference that she would use it. Um, as to your specific question as to whether Ida Dexter would have left herself landlocked or, or not being able to access the property, um, there, there are two other primary means of access which I'll, I will address. Um, but there's also discussion in our brief that goes to that question as to whether um, the fact that this was an intrafamily transaction and, and this transaction somehow necessitated an easement. And the circumstances surrounding the transaction are important because this was near the end of Ida Dexter's life. Um, this was at the end of 1966. She passed away sometime before March <coughs> 1974. She left the property to her son. And if, if it was the case that she, that she continued to go there between 1966 and 1974, our position is that that she would have been able to do so permissively. She would not have needed an easement right to access that property. Um, if she conveyed that property to her son for less than $100, presumably there's a close relationship there, and presumably there would be some sort of a... So Henry, Henry would have let her, let her trespass onto his property to get access instead of there being an implied easement. You're saying it was sort of just implicit because Henry would sort of let his mom use the road even though it was his. Is that, is that the I, theory? I would agree with that, although, although I wouldn't say it was trespassing because if there was permission, it, w it would not be a trespass. And, and I, I think that does go to um, whether or not an easement was necessary. And is that a determination a question of fact or a question of law? I, I think it's a question of law. Um, How so? Because there are really no facts before the court as to what the circumstances were as of 1966. And, and so if it was a question of fact, that is speculation by the land court judge, um, which was improper and incorrect. And I, I would refer the court to the Boston College versus the trustees of um, Sacred Heart case, which is cited in our, in our brief, um, which does say that it's not an intrafamily case, but it's a, a case involving a Boston College and then I, I believe a private high school that had shared institutional ties to the Catholic Church, close relationship, and the court said you, you can't extrapolate the fact that there was an intent to reserve an easement based upon a land transfer between those two entities. And, and okay. we think that that principle is analogous here, where we have two parties who presumably are close. This, um, the current day Lovett property was essentially gifted by Ida Dexter to Henry, her son. Um, it, it's fair to assume that Henry would allow her to, to use that right of way so, if she needed okay. to. I think you answered my question, but so just, just so I'm clear on it, 
as I understand at least part of your argument on the implied easement, it's that the judge's inference that, as Justice Toon put it, that Ms. Dexter wasn't going to landlock herself um, is not right because there were other ways to access that, that property, right? Correct. Is it then your argument, though, that while it may not be a necessary inference, it was not a permissible inference? That's, I guess, where I'm hung up. Why, couldn't, why, why could the judge not draw that inference as a matter of law? And if, if the judge could, then don't we owe some deference to the fact finder on that? Well, I, I, I don't think this court owes any deference to a, any inference drawn by the trial court, and particularly okay. inferences that are drawn solely from deeds going back to 1966, where there was no other evidence to provide an inference there. Um, so to the extent that it's a, your question goes to whether or not a it's permissible a, inference, yeah. a permissible inference, I, I do think that's, it, it's not permissible because it goes against what the standard is. And the standard on finding an implied easement is you have to look to the intent of the parties, but you also have to look to, um, in looking at the intent, you have to determine whether an implied easement is reasonably necessary. And the fact that there are two other easements in this case which would provide rights of access to the Lovett property at that time. So can, can I just ask, so we've got the yellow, what you, what you call the yellow right away, which is Bennett Road, is that correct? Correct, yes. And the judge said, well, no, because that was kind of obstructed by a house in the way. It wasn't very, you know, easy to use right away and so is that you say that that finding was clearly erroneous to find that it was obstructed or um and that was that was the one of the basis and the judge also said there was like no evidence that was being used at the time correct so so there are two rights of way and the yellow right of way is, is different than the one that was encroached by the house um that's the one that we refer to as the red right of way and the finding that the trial judge made with respect to the red right of way in the encroachment saying that this goes through a lawn was based upon the trial judge's, trial judge's view, which occurred in 2022. And, and our position with respect to the view is the inquiry is as of 1966. And there's no evidence as to what that property looked like in 1966. There was no evidence before the court as to whether that house existed at that time, whether that lawn was there at that time. And there was also evidence in the record from a prior deposition of the appellee, James Lovett, that if you walk that red right of way, there are showings of pavement. So at one point, um, there does appear to have been some use of, of that right of way. For the hey, but is there evidence on the other side establishing that that was a usable right of way as of 1966? I understand that your side doesn't have the ultimate burden of proof, but you're trying, if you're trying to establish that it wasn't reasonably necessary to use the, the green disputed right of way, don't you have some obligation to establish that this, the red was actually a viable right away at that time? So the you're just saying, well, there isn't evidence one way or the other. I'm not sure how that cuts for you. Well, I, I do think that's important, as Your Honor mentioned, with respect to the burden of proof. It is the appellee's burden. Um, it, the, with respect to the red right of way, the fact that there is some showings of pavement, I think, is an indication and, and a potential inference that this court could draw with respect to prior use. Um, but the yellow right of way, I think, answers that question conclusively. And that, that's a different um, right of way which goes, I, I believe, north more along the properties that directly or are closer to Lake Lashaway. And what the trial judge said was, well, it, it appears there's a road there, but it's very narrow and, and impassable. And that goes to, I think there are two mistakes that the trial judge made with respect to that point. The first is that he appeared to be evaluating the passability of that right of way as... As of the view? As of the view when there's a larger year-round house, need more vehicular access, as opposed to a summer camp, which previously was under 1,000 square feet. Um, more infrequent access, seasonal access. Um, and second, there is testimony in the record, uh, again, a prior deposition testimony, so it wasn't live before the court, of a longtime neighbor who had testified, this is Janet Nelson. Janet Nelson. She right. testified that the green right-of-way, the disputed right-of-way, was impassable. It's, it, 
it's up or it goes downhill as you go um, toward Lake Lashaway and it's fairly steep. She testified that the Lovitz and their predecessors always used the yellow right of way, which is the narrow one that the court found was inaccessible. And she had been going to that property for over 60 years. So I think that and is Was important. that testimony admitted by the consent of both parties? Is that right? This is from the 2015 hearing, right? An earlier case. Did both parties agree to have that testimony admitted? Correct. And, and so the evidence in this case was largely done, largely put in by agreement. Yeah. And, and my understanding is that it, it was an agreed exhibit and, and counsel for appellees can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Okay. And your point is, well, that's the only evidence that really talked about what road was passable or not passable as of 1966 because she's been there for a while and she's, she's recalling, right, and there's nothing else one way or the other. Is that, is that your position as to what right of ways were passable or not at the time? As of 1966, the only evidence in the record, if the court accepts the testimony of Janet Nelson, is that the yellow right of way was passable and was in fact used. Because her testimony, as you said, was in 2015. She said she had been going there for over 60 years. That would encompass the relevant time period. So that's the only evidence in the record as to which right of way was used as of 1966. Um, and her testimony was also that the disputed right of way was not used. Um, so, based upon the, the yellow access or the yellow right of way and the red right of way, which does appear to show some older signs of use, which the court could infer was used to access the Lovett property, um, the, I think a, a far more plausible inference is that it was not the disputed right of way, but was the um, yellow and or red rights of way. Thank you, Attorney DeCenzo. We appreciate the argument. Thank you. We'll hear from counsel for the appellee. Thank you. Uh, and if it may please the court, my name is Damian Berthium. I represent uh, the Lovitz in this matter, the, the appellees. Uh, having been here and listen to some prior cases this morning, uh, I've heard some prior discussion about the standard of review. And I think that that is important here. It's always important. Uh, particularly in light of some of the arguments that have been, been briefed by my brother, uh, as well as that have been raised this morning. Uh, I'd suggest that this case is one involving uh, a finding that the appellant has, or, or a requirement that the appellant has to prove clear error on the part of the land court. Um, they've briefed and they've argued that this is a de novo review based upon the fact that this is essentially uh, an examination of documents. I, I think, however, it's more than that. Uh, and I, I heard, I was listening in the other room, so I'm not sure who said it, but I heard someone say, if it's going to be de novo, what's the point of the trial? And I think that the land court judge here is owed significant deference based upon his decision and based upon the, the detailed reasoned decision that, that he actually wrote. Uh, this, is, this was not a summary judgment case where we submitted uh, a number of documents and argued about the effect of those documents. It was not uh, something that was submitted upon an agreed statement of facts. Uh, the appellants called an expert. We called an expert. The judge took a view. And all of that factored into the judge's decision. Any uh, thoughts on... The argument that the view is not terribly helpful since the question is what was the status of the property 1966 as opposed to in two, two, whatever year this was, a couple of years ago. Well, I, I think that I, uh, on, on one hand I would say what's, what's the point of taking a view if we're, if we're not going to consider the way it looks now and the way it's laid out there now. there was testimony about how the property was either similar or different, that would right. be helpful. It, it would be. Because it's a visual, it like, gives the fact finder some visual, concrete, uh, three-dimensional. Right. I, I do think, though, that by taking a view, the judge is, is able to recognize the condition of the property, the layout of the structures, uh, and, and have an appreciation for the neighborhood and, and the way that people are uh, entering and exiting the property now. Um, in terms of the argument that it, that may have been different in 1966, I still think that that gives the judge an opportunity to have a feeling for the neighborhood, to look at the plans 
and the legal descriptions and the, the chalks that are produced by the experts and understand actually the means of egress into and out of the property. Um, Can I just you know, ask you what, what I think is the biggest problem for, sure. for your case, which is the point about was access on the, the disputed easement reasonably necessary in 1966? And, and your uh, uh, the counsel for the Wojcik say, well, the only evidence we have is this testimony from Janet Nelson, who said that the, the disputed easement was impassable and that they used the, what they call the yellow uh, right of way to get to the public way. And they say that's all there is about what was happening on the ground in 1966 and everything else is just kind of speculation. So what's your response to that? Sure. So in terms of whether or not it was reasonably necessary, I guess what I would say is that, that, that first and foremost, even with the finding of merger and the need to, we said, resuscitate or, or, or restate the, the easement, revive the is another one. We could, yeah, we could, use, we could use those yeah. interchangeably. Uh, Judge Toon's having some fun at my expense. <laughs> so it's okay. To the extent that that's uh, that it's necessary to, to prove a reasonable necessity, that requires a look at what the intention of the parties was as well. It's not just, was this the only means of egress in or out? It's, it's what was the intention of the parties? Your best evidence on that? Well, the best evidence on that, I think there's a few things. Number one, my, my brother just stood up and argued that it's likely that Mrs. Dexter would still be allowed to use that. Well, if she weren't allowed to use, if she, if she wasn't looking to use it, why would that even be necessary? They're, they're sort of torturing the history, torturing the documents, torturing these, these other easements to say, well, you should go that way. When in reality, everybody used Bennett Street. Everybody came out. And it, but, but don't you agree that reasonably necessary is a, is a threshold requirement for a, for a finding of implied easement, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be absolute ne necessity, but it has to be more than convenient. So I guess their point is you can't say it was reasonably necessary if the yellow route right of way was available. I think there's, there's two points there. And I think, number one, your, your distinction, be, actually three points, your distinction between reasonable necessity and absolute necessity is one. Okay? I think the second point to consider is that this right of way, known as Bennett Street, the disputed green right of way, was a 15 foot wide easement. Okay? When the merger occurred, only seven and a half feet of that was lost. In other words, this easement was half on the Wojcik property and half on the property owned now by Ruelli. There's no question that the Wojcik's, I'm sorry, that the Lovitz would still have the right to use seven and a half feet of this 15 foot width. Okay, and, and the judge, land court judge found that, that only half of this was extinguished. I'd suggest that it, again, tortures the title history to say, well, you have 15 feet, you lost seven and a half feet, so now you've lost the whole thing. I don't think that's what merger stands for. The other thing that I think I can point to in terms of... Well, you know, how do you get the other seven and a half back? That's the question, right? You, 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 no, one, no one disputes that you kept the 7.5. By, by the implication. Property. Right, but, but how, by implication, right. But to get that other 7.5 from the Wojcik's, you have to have some finding that's reasonable that's. and necessary. So I would I'd direct your attention to uh, the Rivera case that was in my, uh, that was in my, my brief, quoting uh, Zotos, which indicated that the reasonable necessity may arise by the implication of the parties as opposed to necessity. It can be gathered by the language of the instruments read in light of the circumstances and the physical condition and the knowledge of which they may have. Now, I think that what's important in that regard, Your Honor, is that on multiple occasions subsequent to the 1966 conveyance, the predecessors in title to the Wojcik's relied upon plans, which are in evidence. Uh, it's Exhibit 79 and then exhibits 30 through 34. They rely on, on exhibits which show their property being bordered, bounded by this full right of way. I'd suggest that the land court's conclusion that it was inconceivable that Mrs. Dexter would preclude herself from using that access, particularly in light of my brother's argument that she'd sort of expect to be able to use it if it were permissive by her son. Why would she landlock herself? So I think that the judges inference that the land court judge's decision or, or, or feeling that it was, it just made sense 
that she would be able to continue to use this. That's how they get it back. It's it, the reasonable necessity may be implied based upon the intention of the parties. And I think that when you look at the history of uh, the use of these properties through the title, through the, the, the extensive uh, research and discussion of Peter Adams, who went back to 1912 and determined how uh, Bennett Street was originally laid out, how Bennett Street came through this right of way, and how uh, that made its way out to Main Street, I think all of that, all of those factors taken into consideration with this interfamilial transaction, maybe the expectation that they could continue to use it since it was permissive, and then the Wojcik's and their predecessors in title showing this 15 foot wide right away on a plan, I think all of that factors into saying, okay, the intention of the parties was to allow this to be, to be used. Is there any evidence that, you understand the yellow right away to be the Bennett Street? Right the yellow right of way would be Bennett Street to the north of my client's property. Okay. The green right of way would be Bennett Street to the south of my client's property. Right, so the, the judge found that although the Lovett property can be exited along the undisputed Bennett Street right away going north, the record establishes that this route likely did not exist on the ground in the 1930s. Um, nothing in the record suggests this route was ever used, and the court's view suggests that the reason that a house to the north of the Lovett property encroaches into the right of way, making it unduly narrow and practical. Is, is, was he conflating two different right of ways there? We're talking about the encroachment, or is there an encroachment onto the, the, the Bennett Street right of way? Mm -hmm. From what I understand to be the yellow right of way, he's, he's got that correct. I think that there is a house that is almost built in, in, in fact, I think it's Janet Nelson's house, where you can open the door basically into the right of way. Okay. Um, so I think that that is, I don't think that he's conflating the two rights of way. I, th I think my understanding is that that's the yellow one. And my second point is, you know, that's, that's what's happening in the 1930s, but of course we have to look at what happened in 1966. And all it seems is the evidence is, um, Miss, Miss Janet uh, Nelson, who said, oh yeah, we used, we used the Bennett Street Road and we didn't use the, the disputed right of way. Is there any other evidence that even rebuts that at, at the relevant time? Not, not, in the, not in terms of testimony or in terms of uh, expert opinion. The expert opinions related really prior to uh, this time in terms of the creation of the easements but I suggest that the documents in evidence, including the ones that I, I mentioned a moment ago, exhibits 27 and, and exhibits 30 through 34, identify that the disputed area known as Bennett Street was, was shown on those plans. It was laid out as a right of way at that time. Those are all post 1966. That's a 19, the, the first one, exhibit 27, is a 1976 plan. Uh, that the Wojcik's predecessor in title prepared. And then there's two additional plans at exhibits, uh, I believe it's exhibits 30 and 32, which also depict and delineate the disputed area of the right of way. And so I think that, we, again, in terms of looking at the intention of the parties, was the intention that this one house, the, the, what is now the, the Lovett's house, only had the right to use seven and a half feet? Or was the intention that it be used as it always has been? There is evidence in the record that since the Lovett's acquired their property, they had used that. They had used it without objection. Um, what brought this to a head was the Lovett's building a new house there. And the Wojcik's seeking to apparently prevent them from using it after that. So the documentary evidence that's, that's in the record, um, the Lovett's own history of use, not in 1966, but since their acquisition of the property, all mitigate in favor of treating this as a right of way that they did have access to use. And I think that in light of all that, uh, there's no basis to find that the land court judge who did review this, did hear the testimony from the experts, committed any reversible error. Was his, you know, did he do anything that was, that was clearly erroneous? Not, not a substituted judgment standard, but was clearly erroneous. And I don't think that there's evidence to that effect. Can I ask one more question about Certainly. the trespass 
claim? Yes. So if we were, you know, if, if they, if there wasn't an implied easement, then there would be a pretty clear trespass claim done for the excavation of, of the disputed right away because it'd be, it would have affected the 7.5 feet belonging to the Bojacks. Um, but there's this additional part about sort of the, the rocks from the excavation kind of flowing onto property that's undisputedly belongs to the Wojcik's. And I'm not sure I quite understand the land court judge's decision on that. He seemed to be saying it was transitory or not that big of a deal or not intentional. What's your, what's your understanding of why the judge didn't find a trespass as to the rocks coming off of that project going on to what's undisputedly the Wojcik's land? Certainly. So in terms of uh, the trespass, I think that Your Honor used the word transitory, and I think that that's the language that the land court judge used in his decision as well. So in other words, this right of way that, that he viewed when he went out to the property is an unimproved dirt right of way. With grass growing in it, weeds growing in it, things of that nature. This is not a, a paved street, it's not concrete, it's unimproved dirt, gravel, grass. And so in terms of his finding that it was transitory, I think what he found was that gravel that, that the Lovitz had installed within the right of way washed into more gravel and it just became gravel on gravel and that there's no sort of significant change to the area, significant uh, well, it's problem. not transitory, right? The gravel's still there. Well, it's, <laughs> and the judge looked at it in the view and said, wow, there's a lot of vegetation there. But and, and does the, the transitory is the right word? I Maybe think, de minimis or uh, something De like minimis that. may have been, been a word to use as well. I think that what he found was that the, the condition of what he viewed in terms of the right of way with the trespassing gravel on it was no different than what he saw in the area. And this judge, by the way, had taken a view a few years earlier in the first trial as well. So I think he had some familiarity with the area at that point and had seen it prior to the alleged trespass here. See if there are any further questions from the panel. Seeing none, thank you both. The case is well briefed and the case is submitted. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our clerks and court officers, and that concludes our session.